All right, good morning. So, uh, we are moving on. Um, we are moving on not to the overview of computer architecture, uh, but to the processor. All right, we're good to go. So, <laughs> um, in this set of lectures, we'll actually dive into and try to understand what um, is happening inside the processor to execute your assembly code. This is the chapter or the set of lectures where we dispel the magic of computers running on magic. Okay, so um, going back to our computer architecture overview, we kind of left it here where we have a computer, it has some functional elements, um, it, has the, it has the CPU, it has some sort of interconnect, uh, with other elements of the computer, such as the main memory where your data resides, and the whole I.O. system from graphing adapters, mouse, keyboards, disks, etc., etc. Okay, and then all that stuff is laid out in your motherboard, um, as we've seen before. So, um, in this chapter, we'll actually look at what's happening inside the CPU itself here. So the reason we want to know this is because we want to understand, well, one, that there's no magic inside the CPU, but also to understand how fast the programs can execute on different types of architectures over different types of instruction sets. So what we would want to know is the CPU time or how long it takes to execute a particular program on a particular chip or um, when we're comparing two different implementations, hardware implementations of a chip, we want to see which one might be faster. So your CPU time will be governed by the number of instructions in your program. That um, is kind of a factor of your compiler um, and your instruction set architecture, as well as the number of cycles per instruction. So we already know that, there, that processors run on a clock and the faster the clock is, the faster the, the processor. Well, um, this sort of depends on two things. One is the number of cycles per instructions and two is on the clock rate. So if your clock rate increases but so does the number of cycles per instruction, your processor isn't actually getting any faster. Uh, but if we can keep CPI the same but increase the clock rate, then your processor will get faster. So we'll kind of see what um, CPI depends on and what the clock rate depends on. Okay, we'll look at two different processor implementations. Um, first one will be a simplified version um, of, um, of, of, of the processor implementation and then the second one will be a little bit more realistic with uh, a pipeline implementation. Um, so we'll start with a simple version of just trying to get the processor to work at all with our instructions and then we'll try to optimize it using a pipeline. Okay. Um, to explain this, um, I will use or we will use a simplified subset of instructions. So we will have memory reference which is move. Uh, we've seen that instruction in NASM before. And then we'll use only a few set of operations such as add, subtract, and or, and shift left arithmetic, um, which will work only on registers. Okay, so um, this will kind of separate the memory access instructions here from the arithmetic instructions here. Um, and then we'll have simple jumps such as um, an unconditional jump and then a jump on equal. So even with those instructions, you can still basically implement any program you want. Um, it's just going to be a lot harder than, than it already is in assembly. So in general, we want a bit of a, a, bit of a richer instruction set, but um, we can deal with it being a simple and the simple instruction set will make it easier for us to understand what's going on inside a processor. Okay, so... Um, as we discussed, the a CPU has a very few functions. So it has a control mechanism, which makes, makes this a general purpose uh, computer. We'll kind of get into how this works, but it is connected to a few other things. We have the data movement apparatus, which moves um, the data into the IO. We have 
the data processing facility. This is where we do all the arithmetic instructions. And we have a data storage facility, which will be our memory. Okay. So if we look at implementation of logic, you can either implement it in hardware or in software. So in hardware, if you're building a kind of a specialized, not general purpose chip, you will have um, data coming in. There will be some hard-coded sequence of arithmetic and logic functions, and then you're going to get the results. Okay. Um, so just a hard-coded logic on some chip. Um, maybe you can think of like a very, very early kind of handheld games or some sort of an embedded controller. There's really no way to run a program on it. You're just kind of hard coding everything. Okay. The advantage of this is this is going to be very fast. So um, that's nice, but of course you can't change on the fly what this hardware does. So instead, we're going to move into the software approach, which is which is supported by hardware. So the logic, instead of being hardwired, is going to be supported by a series of instructions called a program. And then this sequence of instructions will be reconfigurable. So we still have data coming in. We still have some arithmetic and logic, and then we still get results out. But on each element of data coming in, we were going to control what type of arithmetic or logic functions are executed. Okay, And that will be based on instruction codes uh, managed through an instruction interpreter, which will then send signals into this compute hardware. So this is a bit closer to a calculator where you have some data coming in. You have a sequence of buttons you can press for the arithmetic operations, and then you are the controller um, sending control signals. Your control signal is actually just pressing a button saying, now we're doing addition versus now we're doing subtraction. But instead of you being in the loop interpreting some program that's in your mind, we're going to have the instructions written down. And then based on what those instructions are, the interpreter will effectively press the button for addition on subtraction anytime uh, there's new data coming into this arithmetic and logic unit. Okay. So we can then replace it with the von Neumann architecture where in main memory we have data that the arithmetic and logic operates on. And then we have program control which sends the, the addition or subtraction signals to the ALU based on, you guessed it, instructions stored in main memory. And then of course there's an interface with I.O. But we're mostly concerned about this CPU uh, part of the architecture. Okay. So when we are executing a sense of instructions, you can kind of divide this into two different cycles. Uh, this is a very simplified view, but I think it's a good place to start. So at any point in time, we're going to fetch an instruction. This is our fetch cycle. And then based on what this instruction says, we're going to execute this instruction. And this is going to be execute cycle. After the execute cycle, we go all the way back to the fetch cycle to fetch the next instruction and so on. Okay. So let's look at an example of a very, very simple processor um, interpreting instructions. So we will have um, single operand instructions working on an accumulator. So if we look at our processor, we have our memory here. Um, and here are our instructions. I'll kind of go over that in a second and some at some other addresses we have our data okay and then in our processor we have three types of registers we have the program counter which is the address of the instruction we're executing we have the accumulator which is basically just a single register instead of um, whatever number of registers you have access to in uh, in your x86 or nasm architectures and then um, we have an instruction register, which basically holds the value of the instruction we're currently executing. Okay. So we will only allow very few instructions in this, in this processor. So we're going to have some set of opcodes, which are the first few bits of an instruction that uh, indicate whether the instruction is a load, a store, or an add. Okay. So load is going to be one, store is going to be uh, two and then add is going to be five. We can have some other instructions here on the different upcodes. Okay, and then the instructions will operate on memory directly. 
okay, um, and the accumulator. So for example, the add instruction will have this opcode. So when you translate this assembly into, um, into your machine code, your add instructions will look like this. It will have the opcode, which is five. That's the first byte, okay? And then it will have three bytes for memory access, okay? So that's this, All right? So this translated into machine is 5941. Okay, that makes sense. And all the operations operate on the accumulator where the accumulator register is the implied register in each instruction. Because it's part of each instruction, we don't need to explicitly say which accumulator we're talking about. There's only one. Okay, so let's look at the execution in this simple processor. So in step one, we're going to fetch the data. So our program counter says 300. And so we're going to fetch an instruction from memory at location 300. We basically move this into the instruction register. Okay, now we have um, our data fetched, our instruction fetched. And the next thing we'll do is go into the execute cycle. So we will, in the execute cycle, we will interpret this instruction. We look at the upcode and we say, okay, what is this? 001, okay, that's going to be a load. And so we're going to load into the accumulator, that's the implied register. And we're going to load from memory location 940. Okay, great, so then we look into 940, pull the value from here, put it into the accumulator. Now we're done with the execute instruction. The last thing we do is we increment the program counter for the next cycle. Next cycle. So we're going to fetch the next instruction. Where do we fetch it from? The value of the program counter, which is 301. Okay, great. So we fetch this instruction, put it into instruction register. Great. Now we're going to the execute cycle and we're going to start interpreting this instruction. So we know this is upcode 5. 5 is an add. Okay, great. So we're going to add the location in memory at 941. Great. We look into 941 um, and then we're going to load it. So what are we adding? We are adding first the accumulator and then the instruction in memory. So the value of the accumulator was three. Okay, so we put three here. We send this to our ALU. Then we load the data from memory, 941. Load two from 941, put it here. Do the actual addition. The value is five. Where does it get stored? It gets stored in the accumulator. Okay, so now we change the value of accumulator to five. And then we finally increment the program counter to uh, by, by 1, 2, 302. Start the next cycle, load instructions from 302. That's this. Great. We're done. Now we start interpreting it. We look at the upcode. It's 2. Okay, so it's a store. What are we going to store? We're going to store the value of the accumulator. Where are we going to store it? In okay, memory location 941. So we basically take the value from here and write it into memory at 941. Okay, so basically step by step we fetch this instruction, we then interpret the upcode, we perform the operations and so on and so forth. Okay, so we can start looking a little bit more deeply into how this is done. But first um, let's talk about interrupt. So this is the part where we need to deal with um, our program taking a pause to do something else. So there could be different reasons for that. Um, for example, we have a divide by zero. And so that needs to be handled outside of the program. The program is obviously in some error state. We can have a timer where you know you direct the program to wait and then the timer expires and your program should be invoked again. We can have IO operations that take place or hardware failure if we're relying on, on, on some hardware as part of our program. So when we talk about I.O. operations in particular, different external devices will take a different amount of time to produce some data. Right? So Ethernet is fast. Um, if we have data coming in over the Ethernet, it's coming in quickly and those, up, those interrupts will be fairly frequent. 
On the other hand, if we if our interrupts are coming from from the keyboard, those will be few and far between compared to Ethernet, and so uh, we may need to wait for those to come in a pretty long time. So let's look at a program with with interrupts. So we're executing um, a program, and this is, I guess this is a version without interrupts. We'll get to the interrupts. So we're executing some program, and now we need to write some data. Maybe this is writing a character to the screen, okay? All right, great. So now at this point, we're doing a, a printf. We need to write to a screen. So instead of keep executing our program, we're going to run the printf code, okay? So there's some uh, program IO. This is your printf code, and then Eventually, printf does a hardware interrupt to actually send the data to your screen. That's the I.O. command, and then maybe there's some cleanup of this, um, or the cleanup occurs when the data comes in from the keyboard, right? So this, the general shape of this is that you have some sort of setup, then the actual I.O. command that deals with hardware, and then some sort of teardown of the command. Finally, this is done. We can return the control to our program, keep executing it until we have um, another write or another read or whatever, and then we do this again, okay? So your program keeps getting interrupted in doing all this stuff, right? Now, this has to be executed on the processor, but the IO command itself might take a very, very long time um, in terms of number of cycles. And during this, your program is basically doing nothing but waiting for hardware. So that's a lot of lost time. We can speed this up by using interrupts, okay? So we have our user program, and then whenever we need to do a write, we do switch the context to run the setup. Obviously that has to get done on, on the processor because it's just a some series of instructions. And then we issue the IO command to hardware, okay? Now that happens somewhere else, but it doesn't involve the CPU. And so the CPU can return to actually executing our program and then at some point there's an interrupt that says, okay, we need to pause this program again to deal with the turndown uh, function of the interrupt handler. And when this is done, we return to the program, okay? So we're still breaking out of the program execution to, to execute some program here and some program here, but the IO command, which might take a long time, is no longer forcing our program to pause and just simply wait for the hardware. Okay, so if we look at our cycle again, now we have um, fetch cycles, we have execute cycle, and we have an interrupt cycle. So we fetch an instruction, we execute an instruction, and then we can check the hardware to see if an interrupt has been triggered. If so, we're going to um, go into the interrupt cycle, process it, and then potentially schedule the next instruction from this interrupt code that needs to be executed, okay, instead of our program. So at the end of each uh, execute cycle, we will kind of see if we need to move on to processing an interrupt or we can keep going with our program. So at a high level, that's basically what the computer does, right? It just keeps executing instruction and then keeps checking if it needs to switch to uh, deal with some hardware things that happen that um, need to be handled before we can continue executing our program. All right, good enough. Um, so let's look a little bit more deeply into the, what the processor actually does. So it turns out that instead of there being a fetch um, and execute cycle, this actually gets broken down a little bit further uh, and tied more closely to hardware. So um, at a high level, and this is still not the full picture, but it starts getting really close. Um, we're going to have a, um, so we're going to divide the CPU function into fetching the instruction, interpreting the instruction, fetching the data for the instruction, processing the data for the instruction as directed by the instruction opcode, and then finally writing the results of the data back into memory. Okay, um, each of these uh, stages needs to take place during one cycle. Okay, so it actually will take five cycles in this case to execute 
the full instruction. Okay? And the idea is to make this as a general purpose or as reusable or as fast as possible. Right? Um, and so we will try to um, look at the instruction sets and look at the hardware and try to kind of match them together in a very simple uh, pattern that corresponds to many different instruction types. Okay, we'll, we'll see some examples of that in a second. Okay, so before we kind of get into that, let's look at the data flow of the different elements inside a computer. So we have the CPU, okay? Um, we have the memory and we have the I.O. And those things need to connect over some set of wires that pass in particular information that um, allow these modules to operate. Okay? So uh, if you're feeling ambitious, you can pause this and try to figure out logically how these things fit together. Um, and I will... Um, if you're ready to unpause, I will show you um, how this, how these things can be connected. Okay. So let's start with memory. So we get some information from memory. We're going to get two things from here. We will get both instructions and data being read from different parts of the memory. For from memory's perspective, this is all data. But when we connect this to the processor, okay some of the memory read will be instructions and some of the memory read will be data. Okay? Um, now, when the processor executes, for example, a, a load instruction or some instruction to write data out, um, we're going to have an address that comes out of here. Maybe, let me see if I can use different colors for stuff. Okay. So we're going to have an address that comes out and it directs um, the I.O. module as to what to do. Uh, for example, operations to different, um, different hardware devices such as screen or keyboard or mouse or printer will be um, accessed through different specific parts of, of the memory, which will be the address. Okay, so some of the addresses are mapped onto the I.O. and some of the addresses are mapped onto, onto memory. So, um, okay, great. We can then also have uh, some sort of control signals that come out of the processor. Okay, and this will, for example, tell um, the I.O. module whether it should read or whether it should write the data. Okay. Um, and then we will, of course, have data coming out of here. Um, and that will also go into here. Okay. This is the internal data, external data being stuff coming out of the keyboard, um, right? Or maybe um, external data going into the monitor. Okay. Um, so depending on what is the result of the interaction with the um, with the IO module, we may have some sort of interrupts produced, which will then affect the processor. Okay, so those are being sent back. And um, then we can have some internal data that is also being sent to the processor, but most likely it will instead be sent to memory and then to the processor, okay? So we have data coming into memory, but we can also have other type of data coming out of the processor. For example, when we um, save the results of some operation, and that will also go back into memory, okay? So um, read and write functions, course, whether or not we're doing a load operation or a store operation, that will also come out of the processor into here. Okay. And depending on which address is being accessed by inside memory, that will also come from the processor 
into here. All right, so obviously this is very clear and you guys will remember, will be able to remember this for the test. Kidding. Um, so obviously this is a bit of a simplified picture and it's a bit messy, but you get the general idea of how data passes um, between the memory, CPU, and the I.O. module to kind of the direct operations of each unit. So we need to dive into this a little bit deeper um, so that this isn't, uh, this, this is still a bit magical, but we want to kind of get it down to the process of uh, granularity of individual bits. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit about the clock cycle. Um, the clock basically directs different, different units to do certain operations, okay? So the clock cycle is, is basically just an oscillation on a wire of high voltage and low voltage. Um, and each functional element is connected to the, to the clock wire, and when the clock spikes up, okay, the element will do something, and then the clock will reset, and then when the clock spikes up again, this element will do something. So in here, the clock cycle, kind of this wave, progresses from left to right, and as this rising edge passes different elements, these elements will do certain things, okay? So you can think of it, you can look at the CPU um, element and we can say that, you know, when the clock hits, it passes, it does the calculation of, for example, some instruction and it passes the data into the output wires to send them, okay? So the clock edge just triggers different hardware to do something uh, to, and that transforms whatever it, incoming data it has into some outgoing data that then arrives at the next module and when the clock cycle hits here then that module moves moves data from inputs to outputs okay so ba so basically the faster is the clock or the more frequent is the clock the at a higher the higher the rate at which data will be passed from the input of one element into the output of one element um, but it also means there's less time for the processing to happen inside each of this element. Okay, so each element will need some time to actually, you know, to, to actually do the computation, to actually, uh, for the electricity to flow through its gates. And so there's only so, um, there's some trade-off between kind of the amount of complexity you can do at a functional unit uh, through its different gates. Um, and how much time is allowed for that given the clock cycle. Okay, so let's start building our data path. Um, we'll do it incrementally by adding different hardware um, to start doing different functions. Okay? So the first thing we want to do is uh, to fetch each instruction. And I will give you guys three different functional elements. I'll give you an instruction memory which takes an instruction address and spits up the instruction. I will give you the program counter, which is the register that holds, um, uh, th that keeps track of what instruction we're fetching, okay? And then I will give you an adder. And let's see if you guys can pull those together or wire those together to implement instruction fetch. You can pause now. And if you unpaused, here's the solution, okay? So, we have the program counter, which contains the next memory address that we need, from which we need to fetch the instruction. Okay, we pass that into our instruction memory module. Okay? The instruction memory will look at this address and produce the instruction. This will pass onto the processor. In the meantime, we will take the program counter value, pass it to an adder, and then we will add four to it. Okay? And we will then move um, into the program counter, the incremented value into the program counter so we can fetch the next instruction. Okay? So very, very simple. After each cycle, each fetch instruction, after in each fetch cycle, um, we start using the program count that has been incremented in the last fetch cycle. Okay. Now we can do something similar when we look at add instructions or arithmetic instructions. 
I am simplifying this uh, heavily. So again, we have um, arithmetic instructions, which can move data between registers or can um, add data or subtract data. Uh, but all these arithmetic instructions will operate only on registers. Okay, so no memory accesses here, as would be the case in NASM. Okay, so each instruction will be represented, uh, each or assembly instruction will be represented in some set of bits in machine code. Okay, so our add instruction will be represented as some upcode. This would be, let's say, one or two bytes, um, just like we did in um, in the beginning where we had this very, very simple processor with an accumulator. So add um, is actually the instruction 01. And then for all the instructions in NASM or x86, you would have different upcodes. Okay? And those would be stored as some number of bytes. Um, you will have some number of bytes for the destination register and for the source register. Okay? You need enough bytes to uniquely identify the register. So let's say if we have 32 registers, we're going to need five bytes um, to uniquely address each one of them. Okay? Um, so this is a very simpl simplified machine instruction format. Um, it's a little bit easier to talk about this when we talk about uh, MIPS or ARM instructions because they're a little bit more regular. Um, x86 is a com complex instruction set architecture and so these formats, these machine formats get quite complex. Um, I think we don't really need to uh, get into how they work in, in practice, but instead we're going to simplify it into um, these kinds of things. So the thing to remember is that we have um, some upcode, which um, is represented by some number of bits, and we have some number of bits for the destination register and some number of bits for the source register. Okay. So then to implement an arithmetic instruction, we can have um, two functional units. One is some bank of registers, okay? And the other one is the ALU that actually performs the computation, okay? So let's see how we can compose those elements um, and fit them together, okay? So let's see. All right, so we're going to take our um, instruction and pass it to here to our register file. So our, we'll take the destination register, okay? And we will pass those bits, um, or rather, let me do it differently. Actually, that's fine. Well, we're taking these bits, okay? The same set of bits. Um, and we're passing them to here, okay? and here. So the same set of bits can be replicated into these two inputs. Okay, we'll see why this is why this matters when we try to write back value to the register file. Okay, then we're going to take um, the value of the second register or the bits of the second register, right, and then we'll pass them in to here. So then we have data going into the AL, ALU. So from the first register, this will be the actual data that's stored in that register. And for the other register, we will have this data coming through. Okay, great. Now the ALU will perform some computation. This depends on the operation that we want to be performed. And so we can take data from the upcode and depending on if the upcode is one or two or whatever else, we can basically pass that in here. And then depending on those bits R, the ALU will do an addition subtraction or simply a move, okay? So finally we get the result of the computation and we can put that into here where it will be written back to the registers, which registers will be will it be written into? Well, the address of the right register, um, which came from here, that is destination. 
Okay? And then depending on the type of computation we're doing, we may get the zero flag or some other set of number of flags sets. We can use those um, later. And then we will also um, pass this instruction. Oh, sorry, we need a different color. We'll pass the instruction here to tell the register that we actually are doing a write. Okay, this will not be the case for all instructions. But for adds and moves, we are writing data back and we want uh, the data to actually take. Okay, so that's how you might wire this up. Okay. The next thing we want to look at is the load or store instructions. Okay, and we looked at those before where we're basically moving data from some value in memory into... Uh, a register. This is a load instruction and or moving data from memory um, uh, sorry or moving data from a register into memory this will be a store instruction and to implement those we will need different functional units we will need a sign extend I'll show you guys how this works and we will also need a, a memory module. Okay so let's look at how we might wire those together. Um, if you want to pause, take a stab at it, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I'll just kind of uh, keep on explaining this. So we have um, a, a, uh, two instructions. We have two move instructions. One is actually a load and one is actually a store. So even though x86 or NASM represents these instructions as like this, what's happening underneath is that those are actually translated into micro instructions, um, which do things um, a little bit more explicitly. So if you have instructions of this format, what this really is is a load instruction where we're adding the immediate, okay, um, into to compute the address. Okay, so simplifying this, we can say this is a load instruction of the plus. Okay? Um, and so we're going to have actually different bits for destination register, the source register, and the immediate, in the immediate in here being this offset. Okay? So, the, so as a micro instruction, this might be represented as something like this, and the store might be represented as something like that, but it's a store where we're doing a multiply. Okay? Um, so we can take those micro instructions and actually use bits stored in those um, into um, to use those bits to drive the hardware. Okay? So let's see how we might connect this. Okay? So we're going to take our um, register from here or our destination register, basically the first uh, or the register in this position, and as before, we'll move it into here and here okay great now we're going to take the source register or this register and we'll move it into here as before okay that means that we're going to be moving this data here okay cool so we have data passing into the uh, ALU why are we using the ALU when we just moved using when we're just doing storing or loading. Well, it has to do with this operation being either a plus or, or a multiply. Okay, so what we need then is to take um, the immediate, okay, and we'll pass it all the way around here into the sign extent. Okay, so if this instruction itself takes 32 bits, the immediate can't be 32 bits long because that's going to crowd out all the other stuff that we still need to pass in it. So it's going to be only 16 bits long. And so we need to extend it to be uh, a 32 bit number when we pass it into the ALU. Okay. Now, depending on the operation that we're doing, um, we can pass either a plus or a multiply into the ALU. And this will govern what we're doing with the value of um, the second register, which is register one in here, um, and the value of um, our immediate. 
Okay, so let's say we are uh, adding those. So we're going to get the result from, from here. Um, we'll pass it into, let's say, we'll take this as a blue. Okay, we'll pass the computed address into memory. Now memory will do its, its operation. Okay, um, or for example, if we're, um, if I guess we're storing, if we're writing data, then this address would also be passed here. Okay, depending on the operation that we're performing, either a load or a store, we will pass this into memory write or memory read. <clears throat> so, um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I uh, did this wrong. Let me erase. Okay. So <clears throat> the computer address goes into here. What goes into here is the actual data that we're trying to potentially write into memory if we're doing a store. So that data would come from here. Okay, cool. So if we are reading data, then that read data would go to back to our registers. Okay, cool. So now depending on whether we're doing a, um, a load or a store, okay, we would also send this in set of bits into here to um, have the register file accept data that comes out of memory or not, right? So if it's a load, we would change the value of the registers based on uh, based on the data coming out of memory. Whereas if it's a store, we would simply get data that's being stored. Um, here's the RAX destination. Uh, into register 2 that gets passed into memory and now we're storing with memory write bit being set. So that's basically the data flow here. And now we can extend this if we wanted to to use the same hardware for both arithmetic and for um, and for memory loads and stores. Okay, So this gets a little bit more messy but I'll try to make sense of it for you. Okay. So we have our data coming in. Okay, so we have our um, registers coming in here. And then we have our, I guess this was blue, coming in here to kind of match this. Okay, so data will go here. And then we will get data two uh, coming into the ALU. So we have some options. We can. Uh, what color did we use? We used red. Great. So we have data coming in here. If we're doing an arithmetic operation, such as an add, okay, or in case of this, and if we're doing a loader store, we're going to have green data from sign extend coming in, okay. coming into here. Okay. So we can have two different types of data coming out. Um, depending on what operation we're doing, we're going to control this by the instruction. So if we're doing an add, we're going to multiplex the red data through. If we're doing a memory operation, we're going to multiplex the address through. Okay. Um, the control will also control kind of what we're doing at the ALU. Okay, the ALU result will be passed into the address or the data. What color did we use? Blue. 
Okay, so ALU result will pass into here, or um, if we're doing an an uh, uh, if we're doing an, an uh, a memory operation, okay, or we're gonna have uh, the computed address coming from uh, here. Okay, so we're gonna have a red. here um, okay and then we're gonna have data coming into memory and then we can control whether or not um, the data is supposed to go back to the register um, or if it's supposed to go into memory okay so we can wire this up we have a result okay and this result will go back to here, and it could be that the data is coming in from, from memory, or it could be that the, that the data is actually the result of an add being passed into here without accessing memory if you're just doing arithmetic. Okay, so um, that's basically how this works. We're looking at bits in the instruction and those bits just end up going to different places inside the computer and directing what happens at each functional unit depending on the upcode or a set of bits in the upcode that are included okay so the upcode here will control whether or not we're doing a uh, an add or a multiply and they will also control um, what's happening at each functional unit and also here and depending on what those control bits are the operation of this whole thing together will either um, represent the operations of all these units together will either represent the result of an arithmetic instruction or a load and store instruction or a jump instruction for example which we'll get into later okay so i hope this dispels some of the magic that happens and um let me know if you guys have any questions. I know there's a lot of wires going around. All right. Thanks.